All right, good afternoon. Sorry, this is a little bit later than anticipated, but better late than never. Uh, we're going to be talking about the antebellum north again, and this time we're going to be talking about religion and reform. Now, there are a couple of things that you need to know with this. One is called the Second Great Awakening. Um, if you remember, we talked about something called the Great Awakening uh, earlier in the semester before the the midpoint of the semester where we talked about George Whitefield and Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This is going to be hearkening back to that. This is going to be the second great religious movement that's in our country. And it begins around 1800 and goes into the 1830s. Uh, there are two people who are really responsible for this. One is named Lyman Beecher, who is from Connecticut. And the other one is named Charles Finney, who is from Rochester, New York. Now, just to give you an idea of what this is about, this is like a nationwide wave of revivals. It goes from about 1790 to 1840. The dates are a little bit here and there. Uh, it's mostly New England, but it does spread around the country and it does make its way towards the south. Uh, we've got Lyman Beecher, uh, a little bit about him. Uh, he was a preacher born in Connecticut. He went to Yale, and he was a member of the Presbyterian Church. And he would speak about alcohol and how alcohol and liquor was evil. He also was anti-slavery. He had some disagreements with other Presbyterian ministers, and the Presbyterian Church actually kind of splits up a little bit because of Lyman Beecher. The other guy, Charles Finney, uh, Charles Finney, he uh, believed that God offered himself to everyone, and it was a choice to be good, it was a choice to be bad. And he was very forward thinking for his time. He believed that women praying in public was okay. And he also believed in praying for people by name and accepting people immediately into his churches instead of going through an acceptance process. So both these guys are going to change the way that religion works. Uh, the movement is based out of Rochester, New York. Uh, in fact, Rochester, New York bec becomes known as the burned over district because there is so much talk of religion. Uh, one person said you could not go on the streets and hear any conversation except upon religion because that's the only thing anybody talked about. The Second Great Awakening is going to lead to this nationwide revival, and it's this attempt to reignite the love of religion in the United States, and it's an attempt to make religion more personal. And if you are somebody who considers yourself Methodist or Baptist, the Second Great Awakening was a big part of why those two denominations spread in this country. We also have utopian movements. Utopia, it's this idea of creating a perfect world or a perfect society. And there are a couple different movements that attempt to do this. The most famous are the Mormons. They're still around today. Uh, they were originally founded by Joseph Smith. Uh, Joseph Smith, he says that he discovers the Book of Mormon, which is a newly found book of the Bible. Uh, he is actually from Rochester, New York. So he grew up in this burned over district. Uh, he gains a lot of followers very quickly. He gains a lot of enemies. And because of his enemies, he's forced to move further and further west. He first moves to Ohio, and then he moves to Illinois. And he causes a big stir. In 1843, he says that polygamy is his newest revelation. Uh, an angel came to him and said polygamy was okay. In reality, one of the reasons that he claims that polygamy is okay is to keep the numbers up of his, his movement. Uh, there were so many people who were persecuting them that uh, people started to leave his Mormon group. So polygamy was able to uh, raise the birth rate and have more people born into his movement. Now in Illinois in 1844, he is put in jail along with his brother for treason. And then an angry mob breaks him out of his jail cell 
and then murders him and his brother in 1844. <clears throat> this man named Brigham Young becomes the leader of the Mormons, moves the Mormons to Utah, and you may have heard of Brigham Young. If you're a football fan, BYU, Brigham Young University. The next utopian movement are the Shakers, and these guys are really, really weird. They are centered in upstate New York, just like the Mormons originally started. Uh, they believed in perfectionism. They believed in getting rid of all their worldly property, and they thought they could bring the physical kingdom of heaven down to earth. They believed in absolute chastity. Sex is a sin, pure and simple. No sex whatsoever. Absolute chastity. Now think about it. We, we're this group. We're going to bring you perfectionism. Uh, everybody owns everything. Nobody has property. And we're going to enter the kingdom of heaven together. But no sex. That movement didn't go so well. They thought they could convert other people to keep their movement going. And they said, no thanks. And so... The Shakers pretty much move and die before the Civil War starts. There's another group called Transcendentalists. If you've ever had an American literature or maybe even a British literature class, you've probably heard of Transcendentalists. It's based off of the British Romantic movement. And it's really a philosophy that's going to be really big during the 1820s and 1830s. Uh, the transcendentalist thinkers, they believe that the world is objective. They want full of expression of instincts, full expression of emotions. And they thought that the traditional world around them kind of bound them and kept them from exploring themselves. They thought that society could corrupt the individual and that people were at their best when they're self-reliant. People are at their best when they're independent. Probably... The best known American transcendentalists, Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau. And I know those are going to be two names you've heard of somewhere along the way. Now, transcendentalists, they start something called Brooks Farm. This is going to be outside of Boston. It's going to be in a place called West Roxbury, Massachusetts. And Brooks Farm is started in 1841. It's supposed to be a place where all these individuals can gather together, create a transcendentalist society, give every member the full opportunity for self-realization, every member the full opportunity for individualism. And the idea was that if everybody shared the labor equally, if everybody worked together equally, then everybody could have the same amount of free time, and then you would use that free time to explore yourself. Uh, tensions kind of break out right away. Some people say that they have to do more work. Some people don't understand why they have to do work at all. A fire breaks out in 1847. The building is destroyed and the whole movement just falls apart. They decide that they don't want to rebuild. Now before I do the reform movements, today's secret word is the word SOAP. Soap is very important, especially in this time period. Wash your hands. Use soap. All right, continuing. Reform movements, second half of today's little lecture. There are several different reform movements that are happening in the North right before the Civil War. Number one, temperance movements. And this actually still has a little bit of effect on us today. There were growing groups that were anti-alcohol, anti-drinking. There were groups of people that wanted laws that prevented Sunday alcohol sales, and there are a lot of places in Georgia and the South that still prevent Sunday alcohol sales. That is because of this temperance movement from before the Civil War. Employers were the ones who supported temperance movements because Oftentimes, there was this joke that St. Monday happened where people were nursing their hangovers from the weekend and they couldn't actually work until Tuesday. Another really interesting thing about the temperance movement, there were exceptions. If you were deemed medically necessary to drink, doctors could write you prescriptions to allow you to have alcohol. 
Another place that you find reform movements is in asylums and prisons. There was a woman from Massachusetts named Dorothea Dix. Uh, she would go around and she would report on the conditions of prisons, insane asylums, orphanages, things like that. And she actually put together a report for the legislature, the government of Massachusetts, to show them how bad the conditions were. She found that inmates, orphans, people in insane asylums, they were confined to cages, closets, pens, they're chained, they're naked, they're beaten. Anytime they have any disobedience, they would get punished. And she makes two sort of accusations. She says, number one, the people in these prisons and in these orphanages and in these insane asylums are being treated like animals. And she also says that trained attendants need to be set up. People who know how to understand the prisoners, how to handle the orphans, and how to take care of the insane. So she's going to get humane treatment started for those groups. You start to get public facilities for the, the deaf, the blind, special needs, insane. Uh, you start to get prisons that treat the people like people. So it's a really big deal. We also have public education. Uh, when you look at the United States in 1800, the only place that really has a public school system is going to be up in New England. But by 1860, there's going to be some form of public education in every state. The founder of public education is a guy named Horace Mann. If any of you are going to go into education when you get, when you get past this class, that's the name that you're going to hear somewhere, Horace Mann. And he said that a well-educated population is essential to maintaining democracy. And he's going to say you need to have a minimum school year. That minimum school year needs to be six months long. You have to have formal training for teachers. You need to teach reading. You need to teach writing. You need to teach applicable skills. And you don't need to do so much religious training. Churches will take care of religion. Public schools need to take care of reading, writing, arithmetic, real world scenarios. Now, what's really interesting about this, much like the temperance movements, it was businessmen who push public education. Now, if you think about it, public education does everything a job wants you to do. They teach you that if you work hard, you'll succeed. They teach you to accept instructions of your superiors. And they teach you don't envy the rich. Be happy with what you have. Those were all things that businessmen and employers thought could be used to keep workers in check. Now, last but not least, we have abolition. The abolitionist movement, that is the anti-slavery movement, uh, it had been going on pretty much since slavery began, but here specifically in this country, the first big push to end slavery was with the American Colonization Society in 1817. Their goal was gradual emancipation the former slave owners would be compensated for letting their slaves go, and then they would return the former slaves to Africa. And there's a country in Africa called Liberia, which was one of the, how should we say, experiments with this American colonization society. A couple problems with that idea of returning these former slaves to Africa is they're not actually from Africa. They don't have any African culture, any African language. They are American. So that would be like sending some of you to a foreign country and just dropping you off there. So it was the same thing for them. The American Colonization Society, it was fairly conservative and they were challenged very quickly by a lot more radical people. For example, black abolitionists, they say no to returning people to Africa because most slaves were native born Americans. There were even some, there was this guy named David Walker. He was a free black man in Boston. He called for an open rebellion to end slavery. The next big abolitionist movement starts around 1831. A very famous person named William Lloyd Garrison kind of becomes the voice of the abolitionist movement. And he opens a newspaper called The Liberator. 
and the liberator it's going to spread the message of abolition throughout new england and it's going to get some worldwide following actually if you've ever heard of frederick douglas frederick douglas was paid by william lloyd garrison to do talks around the world Now, what did Garrison and his followers want? Immediate emancipation and immediate equal rights. And he argued that Americans should stop supporting the government because the government was immoral and illegal because it allowed slavery to happen. There was very often a disconnect between white abolitionists and black abolitionists. Many white abolitionists, they just wanted slavery to end, while a lot of black ab abolitionists, they wanted slavery to end and full equality immediately. So there are two very different opinions on what abolition should look like. Now, abolitionists throughout the 1830s and 1840s, they would constantly petition Congress to end slavery. And there were so many petitions put in place that this, this um, rule called the gag rule was put in place in Congress where any petition to end slavery was automatically tabled and thrown in the trash because they wanted to stop any discussion of ending slavery. Now, it's not very democratic. And eventually in 1845, Congress agrees that's not very democratic and they are going to get rid of the gag rule. So that's your really, really quick uh, tour of the reform movements and of the religious movements happening in the North before the Civil War. I'm gonna go real quick to Blackboard for just a moment. And I'm just gonna kind of show you what we have going on. All right, remember in syllabus, the course calendar has been updated. Everything is now due on Sunday nights. We still have the virtual office hours where you can log into Discord or connect to Discord and talk to me as you see fit. Under lessons, this is again where I'm going to be posting all of these videos and the PowerPoints. This is lesson 10 right now, religion and reform. You still have your videos, your readings, your discussion, your quiz, all of that stuff is normal. You also have your lectures and your PowerPoints. And don't forget, there is also the additional quiz, which you'll see me make right now. Here's a little insight into how I make tests. And we'll name this secret word quiz. Submit. Create a question. No, you don't get to see the answer, sorry. Here you go. What are the secret words from the two video lectures of this week? What you'll do, you'll just type in the two secret words, submit it, and then you'll get not only a quiz grade for that, but you will also get credit for attendance. So it has two purposes. One is an easy quiz. The other one, you get attendance credit. All right, well, that is it for this week. Sorry about the picture. The camera doesn't like the light behind me. Have a good weekend, and we will talk to you soon. Bye-bye.